Chung. Kevin Chung is with uh, the Department of uh, uh, Mathematics and Statistics at Carleton. Mathematics and Computer Science, I'm sorry. Statistics, okay. Um, and he's um, been there since 2005. He, he said, holy smoke, it's my 13th year. Um, he, his PhD is 2003 from the University of Waterloo. That's a superb place to get a PhD from. And uh, after that, he went and uh, had an NSER fellowship for a couple of years uh, at, at MIT. And um, his specialty is actually optimization uh, and also building uh, uh, teaching tools for, for students. But today, because I heard him give a superb lecture on uh, the nature of AI, and I see that he is now giving it its newer title, which is machine learning, which is uh, what we used to call a neural network, so what we used to call AI, and uh, it moves on. Kevin, would you help us move on? Thank you, Zach. So Google Science Fair uh, is a worldwide online science competition open to 13 to 18 year olds across the globe. Uh, it started in 2011 and ran until 2016. There was no competition last year, but it will have another round of competition this year. So the grand prize winner of the 2012 Google Science Fair was the 17 year old American Brittany Winger. Her winning project was a cloud-based service for diagnosing breast cancer. Now, for her project, she built a neural network for evaluating fine needle aspirates, looking at nine different attributes. And her work was able to detect 99.1% of the malignancy. At that time, it was 4% better than the best commercial networks available. So it was a remarkable achievement. Now, how did she do that? These are the things that she used. A personal computer, a publicly available data set of breast cancer, an integrated development environment called Eclipse, Java runtime for online stuff, the Google App Engine for running the cloud service, Google Web Toolkit uh, for designing the web interface. What's remarkable is all these things are available for public for free. Uh, except maybe for Google App Engine, uh, it's free to a certain point. After a certain amount of usage, you have to start paying. But these are all available for free. Now, the point I want to make is, not only machine learning is powerful, it's in your hands. For example, if you have one of the latest smartphones, you already have something that does machine learning right on your hand. And it's also in your hands figuratively, because you and I can start doing machine learning now. All you need is a computer and an internet connection. So there are ramifications for this, which I will address later. But do keep that in mind. So there are a lot of applications that we see now that is using machine learning. And I'm just going to quote some success stories uh, from the headlines, we hear about them pretty much almost every day now. So this is just last month from Bloomberg, Alibaba's AI outguns humans in reading test. So the reading test was the uh, Stanford University reading test. It's based on a number of Wikipedia articles and a number of uh, short answer questions. Now Alibaba's AI wasn't the only one that managed to beat humans. Microsoft's version also beat humans, even though it was just by a very small margin. Late last year, we, have this, we had this headline, algorithms are now better than radiologists at diagnosing pneumonia. Um, image recognition is actually a forte for machine learning. And in fact, it's so strong now that some AI experts like Jeff Hinton and 
Andrew Ng, think that we should stop training radiologists now. Okay, so that's not very good news for people who are studying the subject right now. And perhaps the biggest headline in the last couple of years, as far as AI research is concerned, is that computers can now beat the best Go players. And it deep mind uh, AlphaGo beat Korean Go legend Isedo back in 2016. Uh, in that tournament, it was a five game tournament, AlphaGo won four out of the five. And there was another round last year, uh, AlphaGo, which, is now, which was now a better version, uh, took on the Chinese top player, Ke Jie. And at that, at that tournament, uh, Ke Jie did not win a single game. It was a sensational re uh, achievement because for a long time, people didn't think that computers would get, to, uh, get so good at Go so quickly. Uh, computers have been beating humans at chess since 1997, when, it, when Deep Blue, Deep Blue uh, beat uh, Gary Kasparov. But even in, around 2016, people thought it was still five or 10 years away where computers can actually be good at Go. So this changed all that. And DeepMind didn't stop there. So the original AlphaGo actually learned from millions of actual professional games to, to learn the game. But DeepMind thought, well, maybe we don't need the data. So they built a version called AlphaGo Zero it didn't look at any of the past games. It just played against itself millions of times and managed to play Go at a very high level, even higher than the original AlphaGo. And DeepMind didn't even stop there. They built another program called AlphaZero, which can now take on chess, shogi, as well as Go. So any, basically any rule-based board games can now be mastered by a computer. So there are other successes that are being used uh, around us, recommenders such as uh, Netflix or Amazon. So Netflix kind of know what movie you should watch next uh, and always make suggestions. Same thing for Amazon. I get email from them all the time saying, okay, this is the book that you should look into buying. Right? And they are quite successful. Some of the recommendations are actually quite uh, to my liking. Speech processing is another area that has advanced a lot uh, due to machine learning. Fraud detection, creative arts. So there are now systems that actually write symphonies, write novels, make paintings. And narrative generation, we see that uh, in like finance, financial report, for example, if you have business data, you can have system that actually take the data and turn it into a human readable, understandable form. And if you look at weather reports, uh, a lot of the weather reports are actually computer generated. So they're just taking raw data and then output in a way that humans can appreciate. And the biggest thing that is happening right now is autonomous driving. Everybody wants to get there. Uh, but in fact, autonomous cars are already on the street. Sometimes, you know, you, if you go to uh, Seattle or, or Silicon Valley, you might see one of these cars driving around. So it's just a matter of time that this will actually become part of our life. Now, so these are the successes, and if you look at the media, well, you can hear all kinds of crazy stories. But it is important to keep in mind that there's always a difference between hype and reality. All right? And also there's a spectrum between optimism and pessimism. So how did we get there? How did we get to where we are today? So for that, we'll take a look into the past. And I would like to begin with this quote, this statement. So machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work a man can do. When do you think this statement was made? Okay, so, so I'm going to take a poll here, okay? Now, Judging from the language, it's clear that it couldn't have been from the last 10 years, right? So who thinks, okay, so hands up if you think this was made around 2000, the year 2000. Nobody, okay. 1990s, 1980s, 
Okay, a few hands. 1970s. 1960s. 1950s. Okay, so I saw more hands for 1970s. Okay, in fact, it was made in the 1960s. All right, so Herbert Simon uh, had this book called The Shape of Automation for Men and Management. So uh, the book was published in 1965, but the quote was actually made in the 1960s. So there was a version of, uh, of his essay in 1960 that actually had this statement. So it's been quite a while, right? If you think about it, uh, 65, 1960, that's like almost 60 years ago, right? So that's, that's a long time ago. Why, why was that even, why was such a statement even made? Well, that's because at that time, people were so excited about AI research after an important event. So in 1956, uh, there was an event that is regarded as the birth of AI research. Now, certainly AI research didn't start at that time. It started earlier than that, but there was a monumental event. It was a two-month summer research project proposed by four heavyweights in computing and information processing. John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky, Claude Shannon, and Nathaniel Rochester. So they gathered a group of scientists to work on, or to look at, seven aspects of the AI problem. So here are the seven aspects they put on the proposal, on the actual proposal. You can actually read the proposal uh, online. And if you look at the third one, it says neural nets. So neural nets are kind of like what basically what we are calling artificial neural networks nowadays. And so the idea of neural networks is actually quite old. And there are some earlier incarnations of, of these neural networks. So a first uh, widely known model of, uh, of a neuron is by McCulloch Van Pitts. And it a somewhat simplified model by Frank Rosenblatt uh, is called a per perceptron. And Ro Frank Rosenblatt also uh, explained how you can train perceptrons. But for some reason, in research interest into neural networks didn't really take off right after this, perhaps mistakenly uh, caused by uh, a crit criticism by Minsky and Puppet. So they wrote a book titled Perceptrons, and in the book they explained uh, how perceptrons can't be used to learn certain functions. Now there's a debate on whether actually they caused the decline in the interest in neural networks. But anyway, it's making a comeback, so it's no, there's no need to put a finger on, on who to get to blame. But since the 60s, people started looking more into symbolic and logical computing to solve the AI problem without much success. So expectations were very high, people were very excited by computers, uh, but the results were poor. And the biggest issue was that simply they lacked computing power. If you compare the computing power we have on your phone to the best computers they have back then, the phone beats them you know, by a mile, right? And the first AI winter resulted because you know, no results, no funding, right? That's how it goes. So here's a image showing the up and down uh, of AI research. So you can see on the left, there's a peak initial optimism followed by the AI winter. And then there was revival. Uh, it is uh, coincided with the Japan, Japan's uh, fifth generation computer project, which they attempted to build computers that are smart, that you can interact with natural language. And this is also when the expert systems uh, came about. But then again, uh, the hype was just too much and the results were not very good. And so if, and another AI winter followed. Now in the 90s, we saw explosion in computer power uh, and uh, personal computers in particular became very, uh, very capable. And, and the peak there, you little see the little peak there was marked by the, uh, the, the advances in chess playing, uh, Deep Blue beating Gas Probe was basically the pinnacle of, that, uh, of the 90s. And 
as you can see, the progress continued, and we are now in the big data and deep learning era. So what's going to be next? Well, some writers think that we might be heading towards another AI winter. And the reasoning was, well, all the marvelous things that you see right now are just rehashing old ideas from 60 years ago. Okay? It's just that we now made them work, but there's no new ideas. Of course, the other, some other people think that, well, that's not quite true. Well, we are making creative use of these old ideas. And many people are very hopeful that there will be further breakthroughs. So it'll be interesting to see what's going to happen in the next 10 years. One important figure in all this, uh, as far as deep learning is concerned, or machine learning is concerned, is Jeffrey Hinton. So Jeff Hinton is a British cognitive psychologist and a computer scientist. Uh, he currently resides in Toronto. He is a chief scientific advisor at the Vector Institute. And he also uh, works at uh, Google Brain. He is regarded as the godfather of deep learning. And there, there are many reasons why people call him that. He has done a lot of amazing work in deep learning, that's for sure. And he is still very active. Uh, but two papers really stood out. At least uh, two papers got people's attention on deep neural networks. So there was this paper in 1986 that he wrote with two co-authors on backpropagation. So backpropagation is a technique for training large neural networks. Now the idea of backpropagation is actually not new, uh, but it was not spelled out for neural networks at that time. And in 2012, he and two PhD students uh, wrote a paper entering the ImageNet large-scale visual recognition challenge. And they beat the next runner-up in uh, image classification accuracy by 11%, more than 11%. So that was a huge breakthrough. And it was the first time uh, uh, deep neural networks was used uh, for image classification. So that's how people got so interested in uh, deep neural networks since then. Okay, so I've tossed around the word, the phrase, machine learning a few times now. But what on earth is machine learning? Well, ob obviously machines don't learn, uh, uh, not in the way that we humans do. So loosely speaking, machine learning is the process of using machines to obtain efficient models for data. Now, if you are a statistician or you have a statistical background, this is actually nothing new, because statisticians, they build models right, for data all the time. Um, so why, why do we want to do this? Because we are usually dealing with a large amount of data, and you don't want to always go back to the data to look things up. So if you have an efficient model, which is a mathematical model, you can compute with it. You can analyze it. So once you have this model, you can just throw out all the data. So you have two terabytes of data, but you have a small model. Well, then you don't need to deal with two terabytes of data. And that was the key idea. You don't want to work with data directly. You want to work with efficient representations of the data. And this, if, you, if you look at it from this angle, from the angle of mathematics, there's really nothing mysterious about artificial neural networks. In fact, just uh, last month, Francois Cholet, who works at Google, and the author of a very popular machine learning package called Keras, tweeted the following. Neural networks are a sad misnomer. They are neither net neural nor even networks. They are chains of differentiable, parameterized geometric functions trained with gradient descent, a small set of high school level ideas put together. OK, well. Uh, it's true that a lot of these ideas are not very deep. But uh, as far as Ontario is concerned, I'm not so sure this is high school level. Uh, for example, gradient descent relies on multivariate calculus, and we don't teach multivariate calculus until second year university. But in any case, it is possible for me to describe to you uh, most of the math behind artificial neural networks using only high school level math. Okay, and so I'm going to do that. So the basis of, a, of an artificial neural network is what is called a neural unit. 
So on the left, x1 up to xn, so you see x1, x2, dot, 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 xn, are the input values. And you want to take the input values and output a single value called y. Now what this neural unit does is, first, multiply each of these input values x1, x2, and so on, by a weight, w1, w2, and so on. So g is going to take as inputs w1 times x1, w times x2, w all the way to wn times xn, these n weighted values, and do something. Okay, I'm not telling you what it is yet, but it will do something and output another value. And h will take the output value from g and output another value y. All right, so that's it. Okay, that's what this thing does. Now, g is called an aggregate function, and h is called an activation function. So the word aggregate means that, well, you're taking this collection of n values and turn it into one single value. An activation function will basically look at the value and decide what to do. So for the perceptron, the aggregation function is just sum of the weighted input values. So w1, x1 plus all the way to wn times xn. Now usually uh, x1 is hardwired to have a value 1. And that, that, is, uh, that value is called uh, the weight w1 times x1. If x1 is 1, it's called the bias. That's just a technicality. Uh, and for the activation function, the perceptron is very simple. If what g outputs is positive, you return 1. If it's not positive, you return 0. And so that's the perceptron. Now, in the science, uh, Google's fair science fair project that Brittany Wenger did, she used uh, the sigmoid function for, for the activation function h. So depending on your choices for g and h, you get different kinds of neural units. And there are some guidelines or best practices on what to choose for g and h. And that's usually application dependent. All right, so that's one single neural unit. Now you hook them all up, and you get a network of these neural units, which is your neural network. So in this picture, on the left, you have the input layer. Basically, those are the x1 up to xn. So in the middle, we have two hidden layers. So each circle represents a single neural unit. So as you can see, everything in the first hidden layer, every output is connected to the input to the second layer. And then the output layer is hooked up to the output of the second hidden layer. Now, a deep neural network is a network with hundreds or maybe even thousands of these hidden layers. So the architecture of a neural network basically is this. How you connect up these un neural units, what you choose for your aggregate functions, and what you choose for the activation functions. What can change are the weights. So let's go back to this picture. All right. So you fix your g and h for each of these neural units. w1 up to wn are the things that you can change, you can adjust. So the architecture is this picture. But the training is for selecting a good choice of these w values. So the way we represent uh, neural networks is as a function. So here I'm using some sim symbols here. So f of w, x. So x are the input values. W are the parameters you choose for your W for the weights. And if you evaluate this function for a fixed set of W values at x, you'll get your output value y. So now what is training? Well, let's imagine that the input are images. So on the left column, x1 up to xm are m images. And say we just want, want to see if the image has a cat or not. All right. So the true value, the second column, will be zeros and ones. One being uh, there's a cat in the picture, and zero being uh, the absence of a cat. And of course, you have your function representing the, your neural network. Well, it's going to take in the image and output either zero or one. 
certainly you want the function value to match the true value, right? Because you want, you want the neural network to be able to classify cat pictures, okay? But for poor choices of W, that might not happen. So you might have a lot of discrepancies between the function values output by the neural networks and the true values. So you want to find a way to decrease the errors. And what you do is you define a loss function. So a popular loss function is you take the sum of the squares of the differences. So if the true value is 1 and the function value is 0, then your difference is 1 and square is still 1. And then you try to minimize that. So basically, it's now an optimization problem. You're trying to find Ws so that the loss function is as small as possible. Now, there are many choices of loss function depending on the application. Uh, and the way to do it is using gradient descent. Okay? That's the most popular technique right now. Uh, and backpropagation is a technique for doing back, uh, take gradient descent very quickly. And, and that's it. So this is artificial neural networks demystified. Okay? So this is all a mathematical problem. All right, so I'm going to spend a bit of time uh, talking about the future. Well, I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't tell you what things are going to look like 10 years from now. But there are some things that are being looked at right now and will occupy the research uh, community for the next little while. So first of all, there are some limitations of artificial neural networks. If you have a very large neural network, a deep neural network, usually what you need is a large data set, a massive data set, tens of millions of samples, and computing power. And that can be a challenge because, well, not everybody has that kind of data, and not everybody has that kind of computing power. Now, you can imagine some companies do have that kind of data and that kind of computing power. Uh, for the average person, you can still harness the computing power by signing up for one of these uh, cloud computing services. So it's not beyond reach of, say, small business or medium businesses. But for the very large problems, uh, well, you do want specialized hardware. So there's research going on to find ways to reduce the need for massive data and reduce the amount of computing that you need to train these networks. Another limitation is that uh, a lot of these systems function as black boxes. So when you get a decision, say you feed an image that has a cat, but the neural network tells you it doesn't have a cat. You have no way of knowing why that happens. So how did it come to that decision? And this is a problem if you are in the insurance company. If you want to deny a claim, okay, and if the system says no, well, no, no claim, okay, well, you have to be able to to explain uh, why the claim was denied. So if you just use these things uh, without the ability to explain the decision, it, it can become a problem. And sometimes uh, these systems exhibit social biases. Uh, they might exhibit racism, sexism, or ageism. And it's not too hard to imagine that that might be the case, because if your data actually encode in implicitly, biases, and if you feed this data to your computer, well, the computer will learn the biases, not knowingly, right? But because it's, that's what the data is speaking. And there's another problem uh, with uh, some of these new networks is that they are vulnerable to attacks. So you can actually fool a lot of these uh, uh, classification uh, uh, algorithms. And, and uh, I had a lot of fun doing this. So you can actually try this yourself. So uh, this is an adversarial attack on Google's Inception version 3 image classifier. So on the left, you'll see a picture of my digital piano at home. So if I fed the picture uh, to the algorithm, Inception version 3, it will tell me it's upright. So it's OK. I, mean, then I, I'm not, I wasn't expecting it to tell me it's a digital piano. But it looks like upright, upright piano. Now, I used the code by Roman Trusov and created a noise pattern added onto the image. So on the right, you will see a noisy image, a noisy version of the picture. 
when, when I fed this to the classification algorithm, it tells me it's espresso. I have also tried espresso is uh, like a coffee. So I have also tried to come up with a different pattern using the same software and made it and turned the piano into a ski mask. And I've also turned it into lily. In fact, you can start with any picture you like and turn it into anything you like, okay, just by adding some noise. Now, people have known about this uh, for a few years now, and there are defenses against these adversarial attacks. But the fact is, the bad guys are also getting better, right? So there are actually more sophisticated attacks available now. So it's going to be a cat, cat and mouse game for the near future. And this poses a big problem when you have self-driving cars, okay? If someone turns a stop sign into, say, a maximum 100, what's going to happen, right? Okay, so uh, I'm going to step out of my comfort zone and talk about something that uh, is not so technical. So societal impact. So it's starting to get on the news now uh, about uh, the, the danger of automation, right? And in fact, just uh, earlier this month, there was a Gallup poll uh, saying that you know, quite, a, quite many Americans are believing that AI, well, which is really automation, will eliminate more jobs than it creates. So there's already a sentiment that uh, things are not going to look great if, if nothing is done about this. And lots of people have written over this, uh, and they have lots of blog posts, books, uh, more books than I can read, and uh, TED Talks. And some of the, or three of the recent books uh, that I read uh, are these. And in, th in fact, this problem has already been written by Herbert Simon in 1965. Okay, so this is not new, this is nothing new. Uh, now, among these three books, I found Rise of the Robots to be a bit more complete in, in the coverage of the issues. But the key takeaways are the following. So, companies will always seek to improve profit margins and always try to seek efficiency. Uh, pretty much nothing will change that unless you, know, you, you change the entire economic uh, system. Routine predictable jobs will become more and more scarce. And that becomes a monumental challenge for the education sector because we, we will be uh, required to train people who might have been doing the same job that require no thought or little thought for 20 years into something that requires a lot of thought and a lot of skills. How do we do that? Right? You cannot just go from zero to 100 in, in no time. And if, and if massive unemployment does come to pass, well, then the current economic models might not work anymore. Okay, well, if they don't work, then what else would work? And some of these authors, and many authors, in, in fact, offer the option of augmentation. So the idea here is that uh, maybe when humans are working with intelligent machines, they can do some things that machines alone or humans alone cannot do. All right. But that's fine as long as machines do not become so intelligent that, well, it's better to couple machine with machine, right? So until strong AI comes, that, that's still a possibility. But what, what about strong AI? What happens when it does arrive? Okay, strong AI comes under a few different names. General artificial intelligence and full artificial intelligence. So the systems that we see these days are called narrow uh, intelligence, in the sense that they are domain specific. So you cannot just take AlphaGo and expect it to do image classification, all right? And it wouldn't know that it could do classification, I even, even if you set it, set it out to do it. So there's something about human intelligence that manages to pull together different kinds of knowledge and create new solutions. So computers are not quite there yet, but there are people working on it. Now, suppose that it is possible for computers to acquire human-level intelligence. It is conceivable that these computers will try to improve itself, to go beyond human intelligence and arrive at super-intelligence. And it is also quite possible that 
once they become super intelligent, they will figure a way to improve faster and faster to the point where you, know, you get intelligence where no human can ever conceive. And this is what uh, Raymond Kurzweil called the singularity. So in face of a super intelligent machine, how would people regard these machines? Because they have some kind of godlike abilities. And in fact, that's exactly what's happening. People, or at least some people, are deifying AI. So Anthony Lewandowski, uh, he is known for his legal troubles with Waymo and Uber. Uh, and, uh, but he is the dean of a new, region, new religion of artificial intelligence called Way of the Future. You can actually go to the website and find out more about this church. Uh, there's a whole, whole lot yet, but he was interviewed by, some, 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 uh, by Wired uh, on, on, on why, why he created this. So if machines become godlike, and if we refuse to bow down to this god, what can we do? Well, why don't we become machines or become part of the machine? So this is a movement uh, called transhumanism. So it's a way to attain immortality by way of becoming a machine. And when I was preparing this talk, this made me, this reminded me of something that I saw in, when I was a child. So there was this 1970 Japanese animation called Galaxy Express 999. So th the story went like this. There was this boy with his mother. They wanted to uh, go to a place where they can get a machine body. So they are, they are humans. They have human bodies, but they wanted to get machine bodies like many of the other people. Unfortunately, the mother died at the hands of human hunters. And she instructed him to continue the journey. So after some twists and turns, uh, she encountered a woman who said she could bring him to the place where he could get his machine body. So they went on this train called Galaxy Express 999. It's an intergalactic train, and its last stop is the Andromeda Galaxy. This is where you can actually get your machine body for free. So I'm not going to tell you how the story ended, because I never saw the ending. I only read about it. Uh, but what, what this uh, animation made me think is, well, what is the, what was the meaning of uh, human existence? What is the value of being human? And I think these questions are worth thinking about as machines are getting more and more capable. <laughs>